So, as you were just saying, uh, what all humans want and what they desire is flow state. I now that you said that, there's nothing more in the world than I that that I want than to be able to achieve flow state. In my last bout, I did not have flow state, and I can't say I've ever completely felt flow state while being in a fight. I've come close, and when I came close, I did very well, but I still could not say I was in the flow state. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it's tricky. What were you going to say? No, if you could describe a little bit more about that, about how how does flow state play out in an ordinary person's life? You may be somebody that's... Like, I understand with creativity and and those sorts of things, but how about people just, if the like, normal walks of life that aren't into sporting activities or alike? Well, actually, it goes for every experience. So we know about a lot in sports because they talk about being in the zone and Michael Jordan and you use these incredible feats, right? But actually, yeah. everything in life can just be a form of, or a device or a way of creating flow. And our job is, well, what we try and do is we try and prolong those flow states as long as we can. But it's tricky. Some people are very, very good at creating flow states and some people aren't so good at creating flow states. The people who are really good at creating flow states are what Mihai calls uh, autotelic personalities. And the way that these people create flow states is that technically the mind can create games and games are artificial mechanisms to create flow state. That's why we play them to pass the time, right? And um, people who have autotelic personalities can create really good games for themselves and calibrate the challenge levels and their skill levels and the goals and the rules to create these good games that are engaging no matter where they are. And he said, this is exactly what the World War II concentration camp survivors did to live through such insipid scarce circumstances where there's nothing to keep them from going insane but their own minds and they found that the the soldiers that didn't have these kind of autotelic personalities that couldn't create these mental games um they they ended up succumbing to a form of dementia like a form of like a loss of hope that does have real physical impacts on you and you lose the the hope the the strength to live you lose all that vitality so when somebody in ordinary walks of life uh, anybody who is in an ordinary walk of life is just trying to do anything. You can turn it into a game where you could have just did it and it would have been like, okay, it's done, but you wouldn't have flowed with it. You wouldn't have enjoyed it as much as if you turned it into a uh, one of these flow state games. And we sort of want to make this new world spirit where everything we do is kind of for that goal. So whether you're at work, whether you're talking, whether you're raising kids, whatever your activities are, these apps, instead of exploiting you and watching you and selling your data to the highest bidder, actually fundamentally restructures the value uh, chain so that all that we really value in the world is the abundance of flow state for everybody. And the, the trick here is like these corporations might say, well, that's not realistic. Like you'll never be able to compete with these draconian capitalist organizations that want money, money, money. And they'll, you know, they'll, they'll profit maximize at the expense of anything. And they always stay on top because they stay productive. Well, the, the, the counterintuitive surprise is that when you put people into flow state, yeah, you invest in them, but when you put them into flow state, their productivity goes up on average 700%. That wow. is astronomical. That is a capitalist dream, you know? Mm. So when you treat people better, not in terms of a blind, like spoiling or in terms of a, a sort of blind giving, give a man a fish kind of thing, when you actually meet somebody where their truth is, where their spirit really is, and you match them with with um, what suits them specifically, they can it can prolong these flow states where they become more productive than capitalist organizations and they enjoy it more. So you have less healthcare costs, people are more engaged, they want to go to work, they'll give you extra rather than try and hold back to recover after work. And so we want to create a whole new um, world spirit where we have a culture which is based on this you know uh, genuine philosophy this real wisdom like Hegel was talking about this essence of everything and then communicate with the power of those words to pull the spirit of out of anybody you meet whether it's a homeless guy whether it's a, a supermodel whether it's a billionaire it doesn't matter in the end if we do this new world spirit properly we should end up with 
everybody being essential. Everybody will be an essential worker in this new labor uh, paradigm. So the first part of this new um, peaceful revolution is um, culture. The second one is labor. And we're going to call this like whether it's it's like an Uber, except based on this flow state idea of treating everybody like infinitely important and calibrating the resources, not for profit maximization, but for spirit maximization, for flow maximization and create these new economies of flow state. This app we're going to call, I think, the Worldwide Essential Workers app, which kind of plays off the pandemic, right? Everybody in the world knows what an essential worker is now. But we mean it actually in that way, yes, but also in the way that Hegel means it, that everything is a part of this inner essence, including the billionaire class who are kind of using these, um, these apps to sort of create this value production or this profiteering. The reason why they will also be essential and not excluded is because spirit includes everybody. And a lot of these, um, the wealthy and the privileged and the gifted, they themselves feel trapped. This is the irony. When I was running my group Make Poverty History for 10 years at the University of Alberta, I recruited about 500 students every year. And these are like the cream of the crop, the most amazing, good hearted, you know, youth you can find. And over 10 years, I met thousands of them. And what I found was a trend that surprised me that these make poverty history groups don't pull in the poor, the students that are struggling. We only had a couple of them. Those students actually are working one, two jobs. They have student loans. They don't have time for these extracurriculars unless they're gifted with really high IQ. Um, that's the only way you can process that much information and kind of come out. Uh, what we ended up attracting was a lot of the children of the wealthy and usually the most wealthy because interestingly, usually when you accumulate wealth, it's because you care about people and you provide real services. But we're in a system where even these good hearted people feel trapped in that if they don't compete, then they get crushed too. So you're kind of in this race to the bottom, mm -hmm. especially globally. That's why the global poor are really taking a hit with the pandemic. Wherever you can get the cheapest labor, they go. And if you don't do that, you can't compete and then you can't help anybody. So they're sort of trapped. So in the end, this new world spirit creates flow state for everybody. But the only way to do that realistically is to grasp what is really essential, which is this dialectical logic that permeates all things and unif unifies them all in this sort of absolute reason. And uh, these courses, these 38 sessions of spirit are theoretically going to connect us with all the great philosophers and thinkers of the past, whether it's religious, Christian, Buddhist, um, whether it's MMA fighting techniques, mentors, role models, uh, new age, whatever it is, it takes all those truths and puts them in, together in one like system. And then we take that theory and we turn it into a practical spirit, which is this peaceful revolution with the culture, the worldwide essential workers app. And the last part is about healthcare. It's about um, CRISPR, which I don't know if you want to get into that. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. No. Um, uh, um, well, uh, maybe this will be one thing I'll say, and then I don't know if you want to upload these videos, but um, I really think we need to be talking about CRISPR. This is actually what got me to really start moving even faster once I started working for Uber. CRISPR is moving even faster. So CRISPR is a genetic editing technology that won the Nobel Prize in chemistry um, during the pandemic. At first, people thought it was science fiction because, you know, you can go into the cells, they say, and you can edit the new, like the DNA of your own cells in your body. And you can edit yeah. it anywhere you want and put in any DNA you want, take out any DNA you want. And it's very natural because we just hijacked the cell's own immune response. Very cheap, too, compared to what we were doing beforehand. So basically, you can cure all genetic defects now. So there's about 75,000 diseases registered uh, in the world. And uh, we now, I guess, theoretically can cure all 75,000 um, and potentially all of them within maybe, some people are thinking as soon as 20 years. And the monogenetic, the simple like single, simple, like single gene diseases, can be cured probably in the next 10 years because they're simple and they're working on them right now um, quickly. There's about 4,000 labs worldwide. This is amazing. This is going to change everything. 
whoever owns CRISPR is going to make trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars because when you're physically sick or mentally sick, that really interferes with your flow state a lot. So yeah. CRISPR can edit your body, but it can actually edit your neurons. So even if you have clinical depression, you, don't, you have a lack of dopamine, lack of serotonin, all these chemicals, you can stop taking pills and just edit the, the DNA that's causing the hormone imbalance and then get back to a normal state of mind. So it's going to like totally wipe out the big pharma industry. So that's why big pharma... Do they pharma, really want to do that though? Do you think they're willing to do that? Well, that's the trick. That's exactly the perfect question is big pharma is starting to get into CRISPR. They're starting to realize it's the future because they just want to know about product. Like it was so incredible. It was discovered about eight, nine years ago in 2013 or so. It was so incredible that even the Harvard scientists that are working on it, like this guy named David Liu out of Harvard, he said he can't even believe what they're doing. Like he, if you would have told him about CRISPR five years ago, he wouldn't believe it. So when it won the Nobel Prize, it was kind of like the stamp that said worldwide, this is legit. If you put money into this, you're going to get a huge return. And so if you're looking for profit, of course, you're going to get you're going to want to get in. But then there's people like me that are more interested in the spirit and thinking, uh oh, this is going to radically stratify the human species. Right. If, if this is not done in the right spirit, this tool will create an unbridgeable gap between basically gods, demigods and mm -hmm. the rest of us, yeah. because CRISPR is not only the, the end of um, those 75,000 diseases, but it's the end of aging itself. It's secure yeah. to aging because you can put the telomeres back on. They can figure out what the genetic damage is and just put it back together. So this is in, this is like science fiction, but it's actually being taken seriously now. And the big players are starting to get in because it's going to disrupt the old healthcare system. Yeah. So there's an opportunity here that if people who have this philosophical essence, this, this value uh, around this infinite value around flow states and, and the spirit, if we get in there and we say, hold on, we have a chance to change the course of history and take control of CRISPR and start these CRISPR citizen labs that are run by the worldwide essential workers app, right? WeWa under this new culture of wisdom, then we could do all the research in these CRISPR citizen labs for ourselves, own the patents and give the cures to the workers of WeWa for free as a benefit package, guaranteeing access. You don't have to do it. But if you have diabetes and you want to get the cure through CRISPR, you can afford it. Whereas right now, the cures are about 500 grand. It's like you're yeah. gonna, we're going to enter a whole new world of debt slavery, even if you can afford it. You can get one, maybe two in your life, and you work your whole life away. Yeah. But the crazy thing, man, is like we might not even have work to do because robots are starting to replace us faster than the pandemic made us lose our jobs. Or uh, where technology is causing technological unemployment faster than jobs going overseas from developed countries like that's how fast it's moving with technology so we are heading into a crisis point where human beings might become valueless or at least the bottom yeah. layer of us actually to yeah. be honest i don't want to sound too negative because there's a lot of hope but i mean we're all sort of trapped in this system where you know i think three billion people are in some version of moderate poverty and even more than that is is in all three forms of poverty, whether it's abject poverty, the worst kind, uh, moderate poverty, which is like, I think $2 or less per day uh, that you're living on. And then the other one's relative poverty, which is, you know, people in developed countries and the poverty line, stuff like that. If we don't do something, this could get drastically worse. And yeah. if you look at the world economic data, it is, it is getting worse. In fact, in the next eight years, they're saying nothing's gonna change. A third of the global wealth will transfer to the 1%. And I have no hate on the 1%. I know really good wealthy people that are like wondering, what the heck do we do? So we're going to be saving them too. There are guardians. Once you treat them as essential, they will do their part, just like the people, okay. everyone in the system. Um, so there's, there's a chance for us to divert the spirit because the world economic data is saying that in the next eight years, a third of global wealth is going to the 1%. A third. A right third, now, I think I it's over 50% is owned by the 1%. So now it's going to be closer to like 70%. And if you reach that level of stratification, there might not be a way to, to turn around. Like it might not be able to heal itself. We might reach an inflection point. 
And that's what these movies like, you know, Matt Damon's Elysium and, you know, these kind of dystopic movies about, you know, that exact thing happening. It's kind of the data, not the conspiracy theories. The data is saying it's happening. And this is in the middle of like a global catastrophe, like climate change. It's it's very unsettling. And um, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. This is just actual scientists are saying this is happening. So I think CRISPR is going to significantly accelerate what's going to happen in the future in as little as 10 years. Amazing. So I think we need to start these labs as spiritual people, even though it's kind of cringy and it's like, Oh, I don't want my genetics to be edited. It's if, if you feel safe, you should have access. That's all we care. You don't have to do it. Just if you have sickle cell anemia or these torturous diseases like cystic fibrosis or just torturous, torturous diseases, you have access to the cures. If we do all three of these things together with this wisdom, I think we can ch change the course of humanity. And I think we can do yeah. it very, very quickly. For and sure. I feel like that's part of my role is just to get the wisdom part going, yeah. lay out this map, and then have everybody create their own kind of particular versions in this essence, and then start working together in this new level of reasoning, this kind of spiritual yeah. scientific reasoning that bridges impossible divides. Like beforehand, uh, before Hegel anyway, religion and spirituality was the opposite of science and logic, right? They were warring with each other. They're still warring. Yeah. Um, you have atheism and then you kind of have um, uh, theism. This has been going on. This, these wars have been going on for thousands of years. How are you going to get these people to work together? Well, Hegel did it. He actually figured out how they work together in the right logical order. That's also spiritual. So he's solving yeah. problems that are thousands of years old. So we just have to bring it out and show actually everything does have its right order. And once we start yeah. thinking that way, I think we can create some amazing changes. I think so. Yeah. I yeah. think like we got people like Dr. You know, Dr. Joe Dispenza. I feel yeah. he's done a great job of bridging the gap between spirituality and science. But this, a lot of this comes down to like ethics. And I know Hegel touched on the idea of sin and evil. Do you believe in a spiritual sense there is a polarity of a vibrant spirit and one that may be darker and more demonic that can somehow affect people spiritually and make them become greedy and angry and maybe want to strip the wealth off people in this on this planet? Those people, there are people in the world like that right now. Let's not be naive, right? Um, you know, I've been in the international development poverty game my whole life, basically. I grew up in it. So those people are lost. So they're, they're ignorant of the real spirit. These people, everybody has goodness in them, like sociopaths, psychopaths, all these types of even criminals. These people have a connection to spirit or a connection to this world of pure thought that is in somehow one-sided and it's been disconnected whether through a lesion in the brain or a biological tumor or something that prevents actual empathy or these hormones or mere neurons from developing, whatever it is, there's a disconnect happening. The truth, at least in Hegel's words, is that there's actually three spheres to the what he calls the absolute syllogism. There's three main components to reality. And when you get these aberrations in behavior, these lower spirits, they are a misalignment of these three spheres. So the first sphere is what Hegel calls the science of logic. And it's the super sensuous realm that we would th say is heaven or it's what religion tries to approximate. It's really just the realm of pure thought objectively, thinking itself. It's where pure being, it's where these universals of Plato are, the realm of forms, perfect forms, but they grow into each other and they turn themselves into the absolute idea. This absolute idea in its perfect necessity has to negate itself. So it negates itself into absolute freedom from itself because this perfection doesn't know itself externally. It, it's thinking is its being. So we're starting to get into the meat and potatoes, but this, the, the high level view is that this thing can't know itself unless there's something that's not it. So it has to free itself of itself, of its perfection. And it has a radical freedom that it creates outside of itself. That's not it. It has actual freedom. It determines itself. This thing, this second sphere, so we have the science of logic over here, the realm of pure thought. This 
otherness, this opposite, is where nature comes in. This is the being of nature, of sensuousness. This is super sensuousness in reason, perfect reason. And this is sort of like this hyper-free, irrational, chaotic uh, sensuousness. What happens is these two realms are separate, but actually what happens is this logic, this reasoning, this uh, super sensuous, it actually starts to come through the irrationality of the pure being of nature. So when it starts to come through, this is what the laws of physics are, this is what chemistry is, this is what biology is, this is what plants are, animals are, and we are too. We are just a returning back to this super sensuous world. Okay, so what happens is on this path to return, where we remember ourselves, the irrationality of the being of nature actually constitutes a large part of our freedom. So what we think is our caprice, like you can do whatever you want in this world, that's actually the irrationality of nature. It's called caprice. It's actually not genuine freedom. Genuine freedom is only possible when this world of super sensuous logic is actually in harmony with the, the being of nature. And they come together as spirit. That's what spirit is. It starts as mind and it kind of develops into this absolute spirit, which is a community and religion tried to approximate it. What you get, though, is that as this reason comes through, it's incomplete in the in the beginning. Your drives, those instinctual drives, that's just negation working what Hegel calls a bad infinite. It's just repeating this carnal desire over and over again. But it also negates itself. It like uh, the negation negates itself into a higher level. So nature kind of like develops itself through this reasoning until we become self-conscious. And then our self-consciousness um, kind of gets stuck in desires. Like we have animal desires, but the human version of animal desire, uh, animal drives is human desire. But we can then sublate that and we get this meta reflection. And this meta reflection is where you start getting the observer of yourself and you start connecting to this kind of profound awareness of the super sensuous realm of pure thought. That's where infinite power really is. And that's the but when you state, grasp it right? incompletely, you do, you do incomplete things. Um, you, it's what we would say is evil. It's where it's what religion called sin. They were trying to grasp what this incomplete knowledge was. So in some of my sessions, you might have seen there. I think I think this week I'm actually doing. Um, oh, I'm doing the first one tomorrow. So tomorrow, session number six is called um, SOS um, uh, Canceling Sin philosophy and religion that's the title and I, what i realized was what religion was trying to say was logical but they wrapped it in sensuousness and hegel comes along and he says that's the difference between art religion and philosophy is just the amount of sensuousness coding the thoughts the pure thoughts that are moving dialectically everything in the world you can't see these thoughts because they're universals they're in everything you can only see particular instances this is what Aristotle and Plato were talking about. So when you are when you are becoming self-conscious, you're falling prey to the sensuousness because you're finite. You're part of nature. This finiteness is what causes this uh, lack of infinite thinking, lack of real wisdom. This is what sin is in religion. Sin is trying to approximate finitude, logical finitude, but they didn't have the scientific understanding of it. But the real geniuses, the guys that were ahead of the curve, you know, 2000 years ago, Jesus included, Buddha included, Aristotle, all these guys, they understood intuitively, like some were deep in their spirit, because we're always that, right? Um, some are deep inside of them, implicitly is all knowledge. So they had enough of a intuition about it that they could express it in sensuous form. But they couldn't break out of the sensuous form. When you have sensuous form, there's a contingency to it. There's like a uh, there's an arbitrariness to it, and that's part of the being of nature, right? So if you focus on the contingency, on the sensuousness, it'll lead you astray from the essence. You have to be able to distill the essence, the pure thoughts of things, from the unessentiality of the particularity of the of the contingency. That's why religion has gotten a bad rap is because sometimes they have mistaken the unessential for the essential. Uh, but we can't ignore religion, religion, religion because it was the first expression of the pure thoughts coming to itself. Yeah. Philosophy is not just the negation of religion. It's actually a sublation. It's a preserving of the truth and what's good in religion and a canceling of its limit 
and grasping these pure thoughts in themselves as like a science. And so this is kind of what we're doing now. The only way to overcome this sinful, finite thinking is by grasping infinite thinking. That is what is in Hegel's books. He wrote them in an infinite way. That's why with ordinary thinking, we can't grasp it right away because we have finite. If you want to use religious language, we have sinful thinking. But the profound, profound lesson that I got from reading Hegel is that for the religious people who might be watching this, um, if you look at the Garden of Eden, it's a great sensuous story of how the logic actually works, how we became finite. Knowledge is what creates finitude. But the type of knowledge is what differentiates what your being is on earth. So we start off with sin, and in Catholicism we have original sin, right? And it says, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Well, scholasticism for a thousand years really emphasized that you're not worthy and God is beyond you and you can never understand it and all this kind of stuff to the point where, you know, Martin Luther had to come and say, in Christianity anyway, that, wait a minute, this external God is creating a whole bunch of evil things in the world. You're selling indulgences and you're, the church is making a lot of money off the poor and something's wrong here. Something is too human here. This is not what a, a, a God would want. So... They really played up this sinful nature, but they didn't finish the story of the Garden of Eden. So Hegel says, actually, this sinful knowledge is only the beginning. If you continue the story, knowledge isn't always bad. Only finite knowledge is what limits us. And it's a you can't get away from it in the beginning. It's a necessary stage to get to what he calls divine knowledge in religious form. What we call today just like infinitely scientific knowledge. So... What happens is you actually return back to the Garden of Eden through knowledge. So you actually continue the knowledge. You don't negate it. That's what the problem of religion has been that has prevented spirit from flowing. It's actually we are supposed to know. The absolute is present in us. We can know it, but you can only know it as spirit. You can only know it through an infinite form of thinking, and that's what spirit is, grasping that infinite thinking. So that's what Hegel did. He came full circle. He said, yes, this is the truth of the religious mode, but then he completes it. And he says, this second half, this divine knowledge stuff, he says, that's what I'm giving you. He said, that's what I realized. He says, I'm going to give it to you. So anybody who has the ears to hear, you can actually grasp that divine logic of spirit itself. And so that's why religion was onto the truth, but it was the sensuousness that creates that sinful thinking. And if you act from that sin simple thinking then you act in a limited way where you don't recognize yourself in the world in an ideal harmony with it. And that's when you other people and you make them into your enemy and you can't love them, you attack them and you destroy them, you do evil things to them. And, you know, it just spirals. That kind of ignorance just keeps building on itself. And I think that's what we're seeing today is we're seeing, even though we're in the most peaceful period in human history, we're actually seeing that we can still destroy ourselves with our incredible power if we don't take the next level of wisdom with us as we're evolving. And that's what I think is Hegel's place. He was supposed to do that 200 years ago, but he died too soon. And nobody really understood what he had said. So we've been scrambling for 200 years. But now I think we have evolved to a point of rationality where we know what religion was trying to say. And we can unite philosophy and, and uh, science with it like Joe was trying to do. We're realizing the true power of our thinking and what our real reality is like. Our subjectivity and objectivity are actually a lot more dialectical and fluid than we realized. That we actually influence the world quantum mechanically, verified, right? We collapse the wave function, but also it influences us too. And we have this kind of back and forth that he says, you know, Hegel says, when you grasp that essential principle, you actually unite. He says you sublate, you unite subjectivity and objectivity as one thinking. And that's where you start grasping the absolute spirit. So that's where I think, you know, do we have two different natures of spirits? I actually think we have the truth, which is like the science of logic. And then we have this irrationality of absolute freedom in a way from that. And that we are a version, a combination of the two. But true spirit is actually the good. It is always leading us to the good. And it, always, it is always moving forward to return to itself. So really, the evilness is really just ignorance. It's an illusion. Mm -hmm. It's when we act out of false knowledge. But if you have true knowledge that's not informed by trauma or negation, that's when you start embodying the spirit within you. And it's always there. It can come out in anybody. 
And that's our goal. No matter how evil somebody looks, really, it's just a disconnect from the spirit and the realization of it. I truly, truly do believe that. And I've had this conversation with people before. I said to somebody, I said, uh, I I threw this qu- this statement at them to see how they would react. And I said, Hitler, Hitler was a loving person. And they were like, what do you mean? And I said, well, he loved his, his family. He loved his dog. He loved the people in his circle. He had it inside of him, but then he chose to go and, and do the atrocities that he did in this life. And part of my spiritual journey and the great, I think this is the greatest uh, bit of truth that I realized is I, I found that there was always, there was two emotions and everything branched off either love or hate and happiness and joy branched off love and out of hate there was anger and misery and depression. But I noticed that at all times in my life, no matter what circumstance I was in, I could always make a choice and that choice could either be out of love or out of hate. And when I was aware and conscious of that idea, I could then wind it all back, sit, feel it and then make the conscious decision to either go down the right path or the wrong path and i think that's so important to instill that idea in people that there's the choice so that's your you have what i would say is is a universal spirit in you like you are somehow intuitively grasping your connection to this deeper reasoning and that's the kind of that's the kind of thing we need in the world right now because it's really hard like our default mode is negation. Like thinking itself is negation. I know I haven't explained that yet, but um, it creates this otherness and it's our default mode. It's where we start. And animals are doing it too. What makes us human is that we negate that negation and we, we sublate it and we become meta-reflective. And when you start doing this, love comes to you not in a naive way. It comes, it's wise love. So if I was to ask you, you know, what is love? Actually, maybe I'll just ask you right now. What what do you think love is? I think love is the essence of what we are created in, but then how it, how it interacts with the life around us. I would say the definition of love would be wanting the best for others other than yourself. Oh, man. You know, very few people um, say it the way you just said it. Like you said a couple of critical words. That's very Hegelian. Um, Most people give examples of what love is, but they don't say what the essence is. And you just kind of like went straight to the essence, which is rare. So most people say, well, I love my, you know, you, it's friendship. It's, it's a uh, universal guru love, or it's, I love my work or it's what you do that matters, or it's my partner. And, you know, I love them because I'm, I want to be with them. And, but actually all those like five forms of love, whether it's self love, love of work, love of friendship, intimate love, romantic love, or universal love, what they all have in common is that you self recognize with the other, you see yourself in the other. And when you have that self-recognition, that logical recognition in the other, you can love them. And that's what they all have. You love your work because you see yourself in it, ideally. You love your partner because you see yourself. A guru sees themselves everywhere. So they have a universal love. Um, So you're right. The essence has to do with the self-recognition with the other and wanting what is great for them, just like you'd want it for yourself. And, you know, this has been repeated through all the gurus in history, whether it's the second commandment or whether it's Buddha's noble path or it's... It's all that same simplicity, but how do you recognize yourself in an other that looks so evil, like like Hitler? Like you don't understand. Like you would never do that yourself, you'd say. So you can never see yourself in somebody like that. They're absolutely other to you forever. You always have to separate them, negate them forever. You're never going to be that. And you are overcoming that with this example. And I had to do the same thing. And um, when I actually went down that path, I discovered some pretty amazing things that are unsettling at first. And it's that there was goodness to these people. And I don't, I don't know if there's very many Jewish uh, listeners right now. I don't know if this will eventually, like, by the end of the summer, if we do reach critical mass, a lot of people might be watching this. So if you are a, Jew, uh, uh, a Jewish, uh, of, of Jewish background, we are not embracing the Holocaust or anything, like the terrible things that have happened. That was not supposed to happen. That was Hitler giving into something that was not the spirit. 
And when you look into why he did that, this is where the profound empathy starts to come in as much as we want to avoid it. When you look into why he would do that, Germany and the world was in a very a dialectical state of opposites and tensions at the time. And what they were seeing in Germany was that a lot of the business class was being taken up, not by native Germans, apparently, that there was this trend that they couldn't get into business as native Germans because they were already competing with um, an established sort of network. And whether this is made up or it's not made up, they believed it. And so they felt like they had to invent um, a myth to kind of counteract the power of this network, which they, they said were the Jewish um, population, that the Jewish population, because they were diaspora, had adapted um, to their cultures wherever they were in the world so well that they had a disproportional representation in business and law and finance, the higher sort of intellectual arts. And um, you're thinking, you know, this can't be right. But there was an incredible power and cohesion in um, the sort of Jewish diaspora. And I think that Hitler had to invent a myth for the German people that could bond them together as well as the Hebrew religions did of Judaism, like of, you know, Abraham saying that they were the chosen people, right? So the Jews are supposed to be the chosen people. It's in the Bible. And so this is a very powerful narrative that unites people and makes them feel infinitely important. And that was Hegel's point too. He says, actually, that was just a start. Everybody needs to feel that way in the end. They all belong to spirit. You have to have this belonging, this sense of actual recognition with the community. And so there's this very powerful narrative that unites um, the Jewish population. And I think Hitler wanted to emulate that. So he said he made up the Aryan. He didn't make it up, but he actually says that this Aryan race came from India and they had this super, you know, uh, abundance in them. This this sort of we are the God's chosen people that could compete with the Jewish religion. And so they created a cultural a phenomenon that really shocked the world that when you try and bring the God out in people and you treat them as, as if they're essential, they rise to the occasion. And I think that's why Germany was hard to beat is because they triggered flow state in people. Plus they were using amphetamines. They were like, they really pushed the human limit. And, um, hmm. because they didn't understand what Hegel had written, right. They didn't understand true spirit. They were still stuck in the mode of negation. So they had to have an opposition with the Jewish population. And out of that opposition, they couldn't self-recognize. And so there was a bunch of factors that led into like the practical reasons why Hitler went the route he did. But that's, that's where he disconnected from absolute spirit. So when we try and understand, well, why did he do this? Well, if, if somebody was in your country and you thought they were taking over everything and you felt powerless and in inferior, maybe you would want to take extreme action too. Maybe not as extreme as Hitler did, but there was a reason why he was doing what he was doing. It just was the finite reasoning. He didn't go all the way, and it led him down this sensuous path of contingent freedom. And um, I think if you look at why people do these negative things, there's always a reason for it. What really shocked me when I looked even deeper, and this might be controversial, I actually didn't want to believe it when I was first looking into this. But my friend worked in immunology and genetics, and he told me something shocking. I said, why? I said, did you know, man, like if you go on the internet and you look up like how many Nobel Prize winners or how many lawyers or whatever um, are Jewish in a country, it's like a disproportionate amount. Like for the size of the population, which isn't very huge, I think it's like a few million people are Jewish. A huge percentage is in these um, professions. And like, yeah, that's a very well-known fact. I was like, really? I said, why? He says, well, at least in the schools he was in, they, they taught the genetics behind why there was such a disproportionate representation of Jewish people in these highly intellectual positions. And they said it was genetic. It was because um, there's something in the Jewish genetics, uh, the, at least genetic Jews, um, where it creates myelin sheath, that's like white matter in the brain, faster than normal. And it allows dendrites to connect faster and it solidifies memories and it causes faster learning and higher pattern recognition. And I think this can't be right. Like, no way. 
Yeah, there's like actual peer-reviewed studies on this showing that there's actual separations sorry, one, in between. One second, Mark. Can I just stop you there? Sure. I just got someone at the door. I'm sorry. Oh. This is great, though. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I'm like, man, we're going way so, over length, but if you, if you like where this is oh, going, I like what you said. I love so. where it's going. I'm learning a lot, and if any, the people that listen to this are going to learn a great deal as well. So you're talking about the white matter in the brain. Aligns yeah. neuron connections easier. Yeah, and I thought this was a joke at first, but there, if you go on the internet, it's actually right there. It's all there. It's even even amongst Jewish populations, it's different. Like Oriental Jews have a higher than average IQ, um, but they're less than the Ashkenazi Jews, which are supposed to be the pure Jews or something like that. And even in between races, if you believe in races still, genetically we're almost identical, but even in the old stratifications, there's differences. And... I couldn't believe it. I was like, why was why is this happening? That's not to say that there's no hyperintelligence in all races. There are. There's people with 160 IQ in all races, creeds. It's just that the average IQ is different. So I was shocked by that. If this is if this is playing a part in a disproportional representation of Jewish people in these high powers, high positions of power, intellectual power, um, it it could be explained by this genetic change. And this could have happened maybe, you know, way back in the Bible. Maybe that's what Abraham was talking about. You know, he had maybe a, a mutation that caused him to have like a hyper awareness. Maybe he even went psychotic, but it was a, a controlled psychosis, which is actually Nirvana, probably a divine mm -hmm. sort of perspective where you're seeing the world clearly. And maybe that's why he got this message. You're the chosen one, because maybe they had this sort of advantage maybe maybe that's what hitler and his crew were seeing and they were felt threatened by that maybe i was just surprised that there was a little bit of truth to this that i didn't really know before it's still wrong what happened in history if hitler would have been loved properly like there was some kind of lack in him that disconnected him from spirit that's what caused him to go down the wrong route but is there a way where we can embrace the truth of the greatness of, let's say, the Jewish population and all intelligent people on earth? Like right now, the greatest privilege in the world is actually IQ. I think it's the greatest hidden privilege. Success is directly correlated with IQ in all cases except for one case. And this is the case that's constantly uh, recited to kind of refute IQ. But IQ is quite established. It's the single greatest mechanism, despite its flaws, to determine somebody's path in life. The only case where high IQ does not translate into success is when that individual experiences trauma. Trauma and inborn negation inside of you can cause personality defects that cause you to use your intelligence in suboptimal ways and you self-sabotage. It's actually more intense in some cases. So they've done like 50 year studies to show that this is true most of, more, more often than not, that when you have a good childhood and you're not traumatized, your IQ always translate, translates into some kind of harmony, harmony of success, wealth, uh, at least a great community. Um, and the ones that had trauma or abused or experienced something unfortunate struggled. Some of them could get out of it, but that's like one of the only cases where it doesn't translate. So would that explain the success of the Jewish community? Could be. Um, but even outside the Jewish community, we have a, a sort of universal class of high IQ people that are running everything. And I think that this is what the 1% are. It's just the hyper-intelligent getting stuck in a system that they don't know how to slow down or get out of yet. And so I think um, if we restructure society for flow state, we have to take into account those factors. So we will no longer be rewarding people based on absolute production. You know, if you can run five companies and you can do all this crazy you know, production, you get paid more. You're, you're worth more. You're more valuable in this sort of global capitalist system and spirit. What if we change that and we said, actually, what is really important is relative production. So you get paid off of your potential in the world. Like if you are, let's say you have 85 IQ. And, you know, I first found out about this through Jordan Peterson. You know, he, he has his limits. He has his strengths. Everybody is right and wrong in a certain way. But one thing that actually has real science to it is the military will not hire anybody. It's illegal to hire people that have IQs of below 75 because they're, they become a liability. They can't handle 
that level of stress or that level of pressure. So if that individual can only be a Walmart greeter, let's say, it's low challenge level for, for average IQ. But for somebody with an 85 IQ, that's actually their full potential. If they put in a good eight hours of being a great Walmart greeter, they should get paid or get the same respect as somebody who has 160 IQ who's running five Fortune 500 companies. And when you treat people with that kind of respect, they should get into flow state, which means as a whole, we should produce 700% more as a society than we're producing right now with the 1% trying to do everything. And these guys are getting burnt out. They're also experiencing anxiety because everybody's turning to them. And as information accumulates exponentially, they can't even keep up. So yeah. they're starting to feel anxiety and depression too. Like anxiety and depression is going up in poor and rich countries. In, in almost every demographic, it's going up. And it's like, okay, this is a universal phenomenon. I think it's because we're not coordinating as a living organism. We're, we're doing the stratification thing and it's causing the vitality of our species to get hoarded. Even if we're not meaning, it's just the system is doing that. It's like it's like um, your feet are getting all the blood and your brain is starting to starve off or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Or maybe the blood or the brain is getting all the blood and now your feet are starting to get gangrene. You know, it's like we're all essential. And I think this critical adjustment for IQ um, is part of that hidden privilege that's creating so much inequality. And I think with the Worldwide Essential Workers Act, WIWA, we have to recalibrate in this very practical way and put people where they actually enter flow. And I think Hitler would have done something like this if he wasn't traumatized. If he wasn't disconnected, he wouldn't have followed the sensuousness. He would have realized how to love the Jewish population and love his own people and recognize that we could all work together in a harmony. But he didn't. So that's where we can love him, but that's also where we can't follow him. And you can do that with, like, even Stalin. That happened to Stalin. He was put into a double bind. I could talk forever about this. I don't know if I'm talking too long. But if you really look into Stalin, he really believed in what he was doing. But he was ruthless about it. He was trying to force history forward faster than, you know, Marx, who created communism, or at least Marxist communism. He gave a warning, and he said, you can't create global, you can't create one-state communism because the capitalist mode of production will undercut you and then you will eventually have to race to the bottom and then treat your people like them. So you'll, you'll lose and you can't rush history. Well, Stalin thought he could by creating the USSR and start going global, right? But there was a timer and that's what led to the wars. There was, in, in dialectics, there's like this opposition that sort of wants to cancel itself. And there's two results of this kind of process of dialectic. The first result is the negative result which is where the sides cancel each other and they, they destroy each other. And the other result is the positive result, the sublation, where you actually get a genuinely, genuinely new state. And we had more of the canceling that happened. We didn't achieve a sublation. We didn't achieve a new kind of society. We were just left with what we had in the beginning, except now everybody was like traumatized. So Stalin was kind of put in this situation where he was trying to rush history because he believed in what he was doing. Um, he was also more ruthless. Like, that's just the truth of his personality type. It came back to haunt him later. But he faced the choice, and this is where I really think it started to go bad for him, was...